I grew up in Shrewsbury, Pennsylvania, which is a real small rural town, kind of central south uh, Pennsylvania. Um, closest big town was Baltimore, uh, Maryland. Um, it was fantastic growing up there. I mean, you know, growing up in a rural area, I mean, so I got to do everything, um, you know, everything outside and just was pretty much always outside uh, doing athletics or some kind of sports. So yeah, it was a great place to grow up. College took me to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and then graduate school to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I think, uh, I think New Mexico, uh, it was so dry and there was no water anywhere that I, it, it just made me like crave water. And so uh, when my girlfriend at the time and I were thinking of where to move, we were like, no, let's go to Miami, like, you know, water everywhere and it'd be great, <laughs> you know. So we, we moved to Miami. <laughs> uh, taekwondo was what I started. And then uh, that was, uh, I was in a brief period when I lived in Ireland. Um, and then we came back to the United States and I uh, switched to Ishinru Karate when I came back here. If I pinpointed something that got me involved, it was probably like Kung Fu action theater. Like, you know, the old Kung Fu movies on Saturday that would play all afternoon long. And um, yeah, Bruce Lee was in those and there was tons of, you know, tons of other old Shaw Brothers movies and stuff like that. But yeah, that's what really sparked my interest. And my parents pretty much, they, they forced me to go to a school to train when I was about 12 because I was just destroying furniture and, you know, and kicking stuff in the living room and, you know, and they were just kind of like, no, no, we, we need an outlet for this. And so they, they enrolled me and yeah, it was, it was the best thing because yeah, it burned up my energy. It was great. Mostly rural, the rural area in Pennsylvania wasn't many choices. You know, it was pretty much what, whatever was available. Um, and at that time it was Taekwondo and Ishinru and then a little bit of Judo and Judo became more popular as time went on. Nice. But yeah, it was like, that was early eighties. And so there, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff going on yet. Um, when I moved to Philly uh, in 86 for college, um, I started training with a man named Tom Updegrove, uh, American Kempo Karate, Ed Parker System, and uh, Yang Style Tai Chi. And within the first month of me being in Tom's school, I realized that he was doing sticks and things within his Kempo program. Um, he would do double stick drills, he would show a stick disarm or thing here or there. And I asked him about it and he said, oh yeah, we've, we've brought Remy Presas in for seminars. Um, and I was like, oh, that would be amazing. And so he brought Remy in again for a seminar and kind of the rest is history. I was hooked. Like, um, I still continued my training in American Kempo and Tai Chi, but um, yeah, I mean, once I kind of saw the Filipino martial arts, it was exactly what I wanted. <laughs> kind of what I was always looking for, something that really trained um, all the ranges of combat, you know, did long range, medium range, close range, even grappling, stand up grappling and ground grappling, um, added different weapons and the ability to, you know, use those weapons. So, um, yeah, that's what I was always looking for. <laughs> so as soon as I found that, I was kind of like, okay, this other training is really cool, but this is what I want to do. Um, and I really poured myself into it. Um, and, you know, and trained with Remy for the pretty much for the rest of college um, while I was in undergraduate school. And and when I, when I left Philly and kind of went to New Mexico, like I had mentioned, that was that was kind of like the first time that I was kind of on my own, um, that I didn't have Remy around. And it wasn't the same as it had been in, in undergraduate school. I didn't have a I didn't have a mentor who was giving me feedback constantly. It was kind of much more like he just said go teach, go explore this, and I'll, I'll talk to you in a couple of years kind of thing. So, you know, it was a little daunting, um, you know, when I, when I left Philly, because I, you know, I had learned so much, but, you know, it was also one of those things I didn't realize that all of a sudden I was going to be on my own. <laughs> Yeah, it was really the, it was really the range and just the the breadth of training like that you know you got to do like what I almost what I call modules on you know any topic in martial arts. I mean, you know, you, oh, there's box okay, there's parts of boxing in Filipino martial arts. Oh, you want to do kicking? Oh, we got Sikran, we got, you know, different ways that we can look at all of those modular pieces that you can add into any martial art, you know. So to me, all that stuff it's, you know, it really is described like Remy always said it, it's all the same. 
you know, and I've always looked at it that way. And I think somebody said to me the other day, oh, it was, it was because of an FMA uh, discussion post about authentic Filipino martial arts and traditional or classical Filipino martial arts. And my answer was, well, progressive art niece is definitely not authentic or traditional because everything that I've ever trained is part of it. You know, there's no way I can take the the Kuntao Silat that I've learned from um, Uncle Bill out. Now, there's no way I could take the Tai Chi, you know, the things that I find that are valuable in Tai Chi for all my Arnis students. I want them to have them, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's part of our training. And so, no, I, I wouldn't say it's authentic, but I would say we use authentic Filipino martial arts concepts in our training. <laughs> because we do everything we do is based on all those concepts I learned you know from the beginning with Remy but it you know it, it has to evolve based on my experiences so in Taekwondo and in karate I was forced into teaching almost right away because my teacher was just like look I need an assistant <laughs> you're it you're over here take this group and go um, and so with karate and Taekwondo I was I was teaching almost right away um, you know, I, I did a bunch of tests and then I was at a, a level and they said, let's go, <laughs> you're going to teach. And it wasn't even at that point, that wasn't even something I had even thought about in martial arts was becoming a teacher. It was just kind of like, oh no, this is what you're going to have to do. And then in Filipino martial arts, Remy, um, he made us teach immediately. <laughs> he always said every time we would come to a seminar at the end of the seminar he would look at me and he'd say Chad I know you learned a lot and I'd say yeah and he says you must go teach it or you will forget <laughs> and and that's that was always his his motto was like you know whatever you learn today go teach it because that's how you're going to remember it better and get better at it you know if you don't if you don't teach it then it just <laughs> it floats away and yeah it's, it's not going to be good for you <laughs> Cross kicking elbow. Kind of what I saw um, just from training with Remy and then kind of exploring the world of other uh, FMA instructors was that there was a lot of base principles and then there were a lot of different progressive ways to go from kind of beginner to advanced within that concept, um, which is kind of where Progressive Arnis, the name Progressive Arnis came from, because that's kind of what I saw was like, wow, this is what's different, you know, in karate. You learn these basics and you put the basics together in different forms and things like that. But you can still look at it and say, oh, that's the basics. <laughs> in Filipino martial arts, after it becomes advanced, you really have to be able to kind of look at it with a discerning eye to see the basics anymore. Because the basics are now hidden within a whole bunch of other stuff. And... You know, when you can see that progression, then it made me see that in everything else that I teach. So the way I teach Tai Chi changed because now it's, oh no, let's look at this base principle and then explore all these progressive, you know, progressions that you can find from that base. That changed the way I teach Tai Chi, um, the way that I think of, of doing Kun Tao Silat. You know, it kind of much more is now based on that idea of progression that you're not just going to take this concept and get good at this you're going to continue to add ch more challenging levels so that that skill you know grows i started formulating the curriculum in 92 um so when i basically when i left philly um, and went to santa fe i had been training um, with two other teachers pretty extensively in seminars and, you know, in lessons when I could, Dan Santo and uh, Billy Bryant. Um, and a lot of the, those ideas of progression were kind of already starting to come out. And so I was, you know, I was, I was looking for a way to, to organize the, the educational mess that is Filipino martial arts. Every teacher I ever had in FMA taught completely off the cuff. Oh, let's do this today. And then we might not see that again for six months. And, you know, and then another teacher would teach something totally different. And then he'd ask a question about that and that would tangent them into a different subject and they would go off subject of what they were going to teach to do something else. And so it was always just one of those things of like, how do I organize this and <laughs> try to remember, you know, any of these skills 
And so it really was just a matter of me like finding those foundational pieces and then just saying like, okay, this foundational piece grows in this progression and we can see it. It's a, it's a linear progression and then we can open it up and make it a kind of open-ended progression, you know, by adding, you know, different things. I had probably a dozen spiral bound notebooks that I had, you know, taken notes with Remy and other teachers over the years. And I was just sifting through them and looking for connections and like, okay, all three of these teachers do this. It must be really important, you know, and just, you know, trying, trying to make sense of it. And then once I had the curriculum and I started teaching it, I realized that 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 idea of oh wait if you can put this into an understandable like progression people get it and they can start doing it and so it really was just a matter of as soon as i had a set from one to ten or from a to z students could you know they could grab a hold of it and they could be like okay let me go practice one through ten and i'll come back and then i'll be good at it and then i'll be able to do 11 through 20 <laughs> you know and so it became one of those things where instead of students looking the way I saw most people looking at all the seminars I was going to, which was kind of like, you know, just deer in the headlights, jaw dropped, to being like, okay, I think I got 10 things to practice. I'm going to go home and I'm going to do that. You know, I made up almost all the names in Progressive Arnese. Um, I looked for, you know, as, as close to legitimate terminology as I could, but when I couldn't find a name, I would just make it up because there were just some things that f for us was just always like Remy's classic response was always do this. This was everything. Anything that he demonstrated was this. So you had, I had to name stuff. I had to say, no, this is an arm drag. This is a take that, uh, uh, a Putar Kapala. Okay, we got that name from Silat, you know? And I just had to look for names of the stuff that we were doing and say, wait, we have to call it this so that we can all be on the same page. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the biggest things was that when I started going through all of the notes and all the progressions, it's like half the stuff just was, it was names were blank because there was no name. It's like technique number one, <laughs> you know, and then the next one was technique number two. But then that next seminar, there was another technique number one, <laughs> you know, and it just always kept piling up. And so I was just kind of like, no, I need to I need to organize this in a way that we can we can actually look at the information. Then I want I want our group to see. Um, you know, I, I want them to see kind of just the underlying principles, you know, that's in all Filipino martial arts. You know, that to me, that saying of Remy's, it's all the same, is really important. We can look at the differences in Filipino martial arts all day, but to me, it's, it's way more educational and way more informative to look at the similarities and to say, okay, why does all of the systems use this kind of footwork? And why do all of the systems have this vertical inside deflection block? You know, it's because that's what works, <laughs> you know? And so when you start to look at it, you know, yeah, there's, there's a lot of similarities in all of these Filipino systems, even though there's hundreds of variations from all the islands. And so to me, that, that speaks volumes to why these arts worked was because even though there was a hundred variations on a, or a thousand variations on a thousand islands, the general principles were all the same, <laughs> you know? So to me, that, that's, I want my students to be able to feel that. And, and through the curriculum, I try to make them better students, um, if that makes sense. Um, I try to teach them ways to learn, um, ways to think about things, pr perspectives to look at training from, so that when they go to a seminar, they can see what the person's doing and immediately have kind of a, a mental format to, to remember the learning and to kind of you know, put it in a place uh, of their memory. That's, oh, it's similar to this. Oh, it's in this category of training. And so they have a, a place where we're always talking about file drawers. It's kind of like, you know, if, if you haven't built a file drawer in your head that says a spotty daga, then every time you practice a spotty daga, you got to find a, a, a place for it. <laughs> but if you've already in your head, you've created this format of, okay, it's, you know, it's long and short. <laughs> 
I know, I know this, so anytime I do this, now it goes into that particular file drawer, <laughs> which means it's easy to find. Um, and so just, you know, to me, things like that within learning are, are, are super important. And I, I've tried to convey a lot of that through the, uh, the Press Varney's curriculum so that they just feel that they're, they're better students. They can learn, you know, in any situation. I would say I'm a, I, I'm an all or nothing. So I, I want all of those. I, I, I don't want to, um, and, and Tai Chi is a really great example of this um, because, you know, most people, you know, okay, you're gonna do Tai Chi, you're gonna do it for health, you're gonna do it for, you know, relaxation, stress relief. And then there's certain people who do Tai Chi and they wanna do it for combat, for, for application. But a lot of times you don't get both. Um, but to me, that's kind of a waste, you know, because it's like one of the things as an acupuncturist that I realized is you're going to get better health benefits from your Tai Chi if you're practicing it combatively. Because you're going to understand your Chi movement better and you're going to understand your, your uh, dissolution of power better and things like that. So it's going to be... You know, it's going to be easier if you have both of those philosophies going on at the same time. So for me, in my Iron I want to I want it to be combative. I think whatever whatever we're practicing, there has to be a combative element. That's the training is happening, whether you're focusing on that or not. It's it's just part of the training. It also should be fitness. You know, because a lot of people are doing this for alternative fitness. They don't want to go to the gym. They don't want to do calisthenics. They'd rather learn something and, and move around like that. So fitness, um, some people are doing it more for the, the spiritual path of it, you know, of, you know, the warrior's path or, or um, you know, just that, you know, ability to, you know, have an activity where, hey, I'm going to go do this for two hours and I'm going to concentrate and I'm going to focus. I'm going to leave all that crap at the door and, <laughs> and go do this and, you know, you know, I think a lot of those people are in it for the, you know, the spiritual part of martial arts, you know, the, you know, the peace of mind and tranquility that it gives you. So I, I want, I want the whole package. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want one of those pieces and I've never been one to focus on just one of those things. Yeah, even if I'm thinking of this as kind of an enlightening exercise, I want it to have combative value, you know, and even if I'm just doing this for fitness today, the combativeness and the spiritual part of it should still be there. Like, you know, so it, to me, it, all of those should be engaged. If you're training properly, all of those should be engaged. And then each student can pick and choose the energy that they want. Because not, obviously not all of them are going to want the combative side. And, and, you know, we all don't have to have the same perspective. And most students don't. You know, they're not all there because they want the most efficient and effective combat moves <laughs> in sparring. Some of them are just there to move around and to relieve some stress and to get out of the house and not have to deal with their kids for an hour or whatever. And so there's a hundred reasons that people might come to class and you can't really force your agenda on them, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, some of the groups that always seem to, you know, okay, it's got to be combat effective. You know, it doesn't for everybody. <laughs> you know, the housewife who's coming in and she just wants to move around and learn something new. It, it, she's never going to spar anybody in, you know, that type of situation where it has to be a thousand percent combat effective. So for her, she just wants to come and have fun and learn new skills and see her coordination develop and, you know, and see her body movement change. That's all she wants to get out of it. So that's fine. You know, it doesn't have to be all things for all people. For me, it is. I want all of those things. And for each person, if the person wants to focus on combat, I think that's fantastic. You know, it, it should be there, you know, and I always use that as a check and a balance when we, when we get somebody in class who's kind of like, okay, how do we use this? You know, and they really want to do the application. Excellent. It makes, it makes me, gives me a check and a balance to make sure all the stuff I'm teaching is combat ready, you know, but do we have to focus on that a hundred percent of the time? Not always. Are, are, are they going to be able to apply what they've learned? Yeah, that's, that would be a big question. I mean, to me, 
a, a lot of a lot of that gets solved in my classes just simply because since it's a backyard group and it's kind of like you know i i kind of get to screen everybody before anybody shows up so you know if if i if it seems like you're tentative then i just kind of explain to you like look you know just because you want to train for a certain concentration or focus doesn't mean that the whole class is training for that focus so you know, you're going to get self-defense out of the training that you're doing with everyone. And, you know, when you explain it to them like that, if they're not willing to just be in class and do what class is doing, then they won't, they won't stay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is fine. That's fine for me. <laughs> you know, because I want them to know, look, this is, this is what this entails. You know, so if, if you're not down with that, then I, I, you're, this probably isn't the class for you. You know, maybe you need to find a class where, you know, it's in a karate dojo and they're just going to show some techniques and then you can go home. You see that and then you have to, you have to respond to them. Well, remember in class when I told you that you, you needed to apply yourself in this way in order to make these things realistic and you didn't do that? That's why it didn't work. You know, and, you know, and so there's always great ways to back all that stuff up with just their behavior in class. Um, you know, because it's never going to be the person who's really enthused, who shows up early, who trains really, really hard and asks great questions. They're never going to be the one who gets in an altercation, gets their ass kicked and comes back and says, why didn't this work? That's only the person who's not training hard and who's not putting the time in. <laughs> so, you know, when, when you get those people, they, they've kind of, you know, what do they say? They made their own bed. <laughs> and if that's what somebody's coming to you and they're saying, look, I, I need to get self-defense out of this, then yeah, you have to have a realistic response. Like, well, you know, you going through the moves is not, is not going to give you self-defense, you know, but taking those moves and then let's, you know, let's put it in inside some real movement and then let's see if you can do some of it. Okay, maybe, maybe then it does work. So... Yeah, I mean, they sort themselves out from what I've seen, <laughs> you know, and a lot of times when I get those strange questions, I'm just like, sure, come to class, you know, and they come for one class. That's, that's the end of it, you know, because they just see that, no, they're not willing to put the work in that, to get to where, you know, they thought they could get from, you know, a 30 minute class or something like that. I don't know what most people think, but <laughs> their, their opinion of self-defense must be like, 10 minutes of tricks or something and I should be good, right? Um, when I was doing Kung Fu as a kid um, in Pennsylvania, um, I, was I was really young and I was pretty much already ready for Black Sash. And they were just kind of like, you can't test for Black Sash yet. <laughs> like, you you're not old enough. Like, they had, they had age requirements. So... Uh, my Sifu at the time was just like, okay, you're going to stay after class. And I would stay after class and he would basically work on students, like people who had injuries and things like that from class or just from life. And I started helping him and he would show, he basically was showing me, you know, twee na. He'd be like, you do this for this person's shoulder. And I would do that for 15 minutes. They'd go home and um, I did that for a couple years and realized when I later went to acupuncture school that he had shown me like so much of Chinese medicine like you know definitely all of Twi Na um, which is massage and manual manipulation but he, he taught me most of the energy meridians most of the acupuncture points when I went to acupuncture school it was really a review <laughs> like you know it really didn't seem like other than Chinese herbology I hadn't really been exposed to herbs um, which is a really major study and so that was all new um, which was great because I needed something to do <laughs> while I was in school. So I focused on herbs. But um, yeah, it, it, to me, it, you know, it, it coincided perfectly. And, and watching my Chinese teachers use it, it, it just seemed so natural that, you know, oh, wait, if you're going to do these things that, you know, you might hurt your students or something, you should, you should have a way to, to help them out afterwards you know, so that they're not injured or they can come back and train great things for martial artists because it's stuff like oh the class everybody's saying their low back is sore cool find the you know find the lumbar stretches and the different things in the twina 
do them at the end of class for everybody and get everybody's back open. And that's kind of always how uh, Sifu Rome was always, you know, talking about it. He was just always like, you know, look, we have to, we have to do this at the end of every class so that everybody can come back to the next class. Because if we don't do this, they might not, they might not be able to come back. Uh, you know, after I saw that and, and just experienced that for, for a number of years, you know, to me, it, it improved my martial arts. Um, because understanding healing, so many things in tween, in tween ah, although they're like manipulations of joints to help and heal the joint, they're really close and similar to joint locks <laughs> like you know and uh, instead of locking the joint I'm just figuring ways to open it or, or things but it, it's all the same leverage just a different intent I guess would be a good way to put it and so when I started seeing those correlations I was just kind of like whoa I wonder if there's other things and you can you know you look at energy levels and how people are moving and you're trying to figure out okay wait if I can get them more energy in these meridians and organs oh they'll move better and you know, so it's just helped me look at people and say, wait, they're having trouble with this footwork. Could be energetic. It might not just be that they don't have the coordination for it. It just might be that their their body's energetics haven't haven't figured that out yet. You know, and so then it it's an easy fix. Okay, let's get some more energy here. Now, does that feel better? And now they're doing it. <laughs> so, you know, and then vice versa. I, I think the um, uh, the martial arts has helped my acupuncture too, um, just in the sense that I've seen so many things over and over again in the martial arts that point back to healing and to, you know, like, oh, wow, this is that same, you know, that same concept, that, that same thing. It's just the opposite side of the coin.